alternative cartoonist uh, based here in Seattle. Uh, shortly after moving here in 1992, he found a circle of young comic book artists and with them aspired to take cliched or neglected genres of comics and revitalize them with the lessons learned from the first wave of alternative comics. Since then, he has published numerous publications and collaborated with many exceptional artists. His latest project is Don't Forget This Song, a graphic novel biography of the Carter family published by Abrams Comic Arts. Let's give it up for David Lasky. Thank you, Eric. Um, so I'm not going to read comics tonight. I'm going to read from a zine of stories called Science Fiction. It's 64 tiny little stories. And I'm going to try and read a selection in, in about 10 minutes. And if I go too long, Graham is going to flash his cell phone at me. And if I don't notice him, maybe you all could just start holding up your cell phone. If you feel I've gone on too long. So these are numbered, so I'll re usually read the number before the stories. Number two, the boy president. He got elected at age five because his hair was styled just right. He urged the country to make things smaller and more kid-friendly. His secretary of state, a cat, enforced leash laws for dogs. The people became disappointed with the choice they had made, especially the dog owners. The boy president was impeached, but allowed to take home all the toys that he and his parents could carry. Number five, thanks to genetic engineering and many computers, cats are finally able to speak English. They ask for things all day long. <laughs> many get jobs so they can buy themselves fancy food and catnip. Soon catnip is made illegal and a black market for it explodes in most cities. Many pet owners opt to turn off their cat's communication abilities, making them all natural once again. <laughs> this is controversial and eventually leads to feline rights legislation. <laughs> Later, feline separatists will form their own micronation on an island in the San Juans, off-limit to humans, but all birds are welcome and encouraged to visit. <laughs> Number eight, Cat Lincoln. Cat Lincoln is the president of all cats. He wears a top hat and a bow tie, like his namesake. He lives in a house in Seattle's Beacon Hill neighborhood with his wife and two kids. While his position is prestigious, he does not receive a salary. He volunteers his services. Many cats are envious, and some have accused him of rigging the election. Cat presidents have no term limits. They serve for life or until they decide to resign. It's kind of like the Pope or Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Cat Lincoln plans to stay president for many years. His real name is not Cat Lincoln, it's Biggles. <laughs> Number 11. Everyone killed everyone else in the last war, except for me. I was the last person on earth. The first thing I did was break into a grocery store and eat all the cakes, pastries, and chocolate. I ate them until I vomited. Then I switched to potato chips, tortilla chips, and crackers. When I had enough, I began to eat canned fruits and vegetables. I found stores that sold pornography and indulged in it until I could not stop crying out of loneliness. I drank and drank and vomited. I wanted to see the treasures of Europe, but I'd never learned to fly. There were plenty of cars around, so I drove all over North America. I felt really guilty that while given such an honor, I was basically squandering it. Number 26, the ultimate World War II movie. Stars Robert Mitchum, John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, Steve McQueen, Dana Andrews, Lee Martin, Jim Brown, Robert Redford, Henry Fonda, Harrison Ford, Ernest Borgnine, etc. A group of misfits is brought together for a suicide mission against a Nazi Alpine fortress. The group includes a leader, a Brooklyn kid, a Jew, a Latino, an African American, a big dumb guy just off the farm, an explosives expert, an egghead, a ladies man, and a quiet man among others. After training and a briefing, they bail out behind enemy lines. Meanwhile, kamikaze has hit aircraft carriers in the Pacific. Back in France, one of the group has been killed, but they press on. Dressing in German uniforms allows them to slip into the fortress unnoticed. Many anonymous Nazi soldiers are killed. Hidden Jews are evacuated. Peasants are liberated. But more casualties for our guys. Finally, victorious explosions. 
Borgnine salutes with enthusiasm, and yet, war is truly hell. <laughs> I was blinded, 32. The flash of the supernova caught me by surprise. I had trouble steering the shuttle and put the android in charge. We had maybe 30 seconds to dock with the mothership or we'd be vaporized. I had a Lady Gaga song stuck in my head. So this is it, I wondered. Lady Gaga? <laughs> 35. PT-109 secret missions file. John F. Kennedy versus Predator. As the war in the Pacific rages on, the crew of the PT-109 finds itself on a tropical island paradise. Something has prevented the Japanese from occupying this island. The natives <coughs> make faces and pantomime to try and communicate that something dangerous lives deep in the jungle. JFK and his crew bring the PT over to the other side of the island and set up a tripwire on a cliff. Exploring the jungle, they are soon attacked by an invisible force, which they interpret as being supernatural. JFK lures the creature to the edge of the cliff, where it hits the tripwire and falls into the sea. From a ledge, he sees the shape of a large humanoid creature in the water. It smashes their PT and then shambles back into the jungle. 38. Patrolling. Scott, not his real name, and I used to wear masks and capes and patrol the Greenwood area. <laughs> we rarely came across anything, much less a criminal. Once, a drunk guy called us fags and we were forced to tase him. <laughs> when Scott got engaged, he announced that he was breaking off our partnership. He and his bride wanted to do their own crime fighting thing. I tried to talk him into bringing on a few more masks and starting a group, but he wasn't interested. I don't go patrolling much anymore, it's not the same. And besides, we've got the police. <laughs> 45. Science fiction. It is the future and money no longer exists. Instead of having jobs, people volunteer extensively. Instead of going shopping, consumers share things with one another. Everyone sleeps in hammocks. The sound of crickets on a summer evening is one of the most highly valued things we have. We write a lot of poems about the crickets. I live by the beach. I am old. I can still remember the feel of a few bills, soft and smelling of ink and fingerprints, and the joys they promised. Those times are gone forever, and now we have the sound of crickets to work toward and to keep us awake at night. 46, science fiction. We live in the future that mankind has long dreamed of. Our interconnected skyscrapers rise all the way to the clouds like a woman's slender fingers. We move easily between them in flying cars, mini helicopters, and jetpacks. Hunger and disease are not known to us. We vacation in luxury hotels along the ocean's floor and cruise the skies in dirigibles. By eliminating money, greed, and power games, we've made humanity happier than it's ever been. They live joyfully and harm, harm, harmoniously in their production zones. Their labors create more of us, along with our spare parts so that this perfect existence may go on forever. Okay. I was the last person on Earth. The ice caps melted and the whole world flooded. As I'm sure you know, I was the captain of a pirate ship. We helped to win World War VII, but my ship went down with all the others in the famous month of squalls. I've been on a damaged lifeboat eating fish whenever one swims close enough, feeling dehydrated. The seagulls are following me, circling. The gulls shall inherit the earth. And finally, number 56. If you were a superhero, what would you wear? And what would you call yourself? Would you tell me your origin story? And would you reveal your secret identity to me? Would you use your powers to make a better world? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you, David. Um, up next, we have Morris Stegosaurus. And uh, I'm just going to read. He just put this book out. Uh, and I think he might actually have some here, if I uh, remember right. So. Might want to ask him, but I'm just going to read what uh, Evan Peterson. Here on this table. 
Oh, no, there are some. Are so if yeah. you would like one of his books, um, and this is what Evan Peterson, the uh, publisher at Minor Arcana Press, uh, had to say. In Zebra Feathers, seasoned performance poet Morris Stegosaurus delivers his intimidably slick and brilliant wordplay via page, losing none of his bombast. He offers readers a bizarre, hilarious romp through a world of plush anthro anthropomorphic animals, mystical surrealism, and absurdist commentary on our own increasingly cartoonish culture. Yet even at its most dizzying psychedelic, the poems maintain a vital core of vulnerability. The poetic tradition of loneliness, the outsider's struggle to understand why normal, and normals in quotes, why normal people laugh and cry at the wrong things. Zebra Brothers is all at once an allegory, a satire, and a completely authentic vision of reality as seen through the eyes of a diapered puppy dogs and flying zebras. Ladies and gentlemen, Morris Stegosaurus.